But uh, it's good to see each one of you here this morning, and I do want us to go to prayer again, and I want us to, as Mike mentioned, our country and all, and I, I had some notes down here I want to uh, just remind us that we have a special prayer that we need for our country today, and uh, we need to pray for this country and the leadership that we have, for the lack of that we need to get, and uh, we need to... Uh, Remember those back in Afghanistan that are still there, that are kind of locked in, having a hard time. And it's sort of, you know, when I look at it, it's not sort of, it is sad what's happening. And, uh, you know, the decimation is taking place for those people there. And uh, a lot of them helped us quite a bit. And then also the ones that are just there that are Americans. And we've always said, no man left behind, but we have backed up on that one. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we here in America, and, and, you know, we don't like to admit this and say, well, I didn't vote for that one, I didn't vote for that. It don't matter. America's America, and we are America. And uh, we have, as America, as our country, has made some big mistakes and uh, caused some real problems. and. There, some of them have been disastrous in recent days. I mean, killing innocent people and saying, I'm sorry, yeah. that don't cut it. We need to be smarter than that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was a time where we were very precise in what we did. We could pinpoint it to a, the head of a needle. Now we seem like this, you know, helter scout or whatever, just throw it there. And, uh, but we need to ask God to wake up America and those ideas and those things there, and also our border crisis, and that is yeah. one mess. And it seems to be getting, as somebody said one time, huger and huger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we need to really pray for our country today, and I want us to do that this time, if you would. Father, we love you today, and thank you that we have opportunity to call upon your wonderful mm -hmm. name. Lord, we know that what's taking place is not a surprise to you as we'll discuss today. But Lord, as well, we know that uh, we could do better. And Lord, we need to do better. And I pray, Father, that what's taking place will drive people to their knees. And they'll look up and say, God, help us. Lord, we need to come to that place instead of just passing the buck on down the road. I pray, Father, that our leadership would some way or another be changed, turned around, or whatever. Lord, we, we see the good things happening, but then there's so much bad that you can't even enjoy the good. And I pray, Father, for those that are there in our military forces, Lord, the leadership all the way down to the, the footman. I ask you to bless and to be with them and to help them to realize that our country is something we're fighting for, dying for. And Lord, I pray that you'll just be with our young people, that uh, they'll get back into the idea of taking a stand for right. And Lord, I pray that you will help our leadership to do what they need to do and to lead and not cower down and blame somebody else or who used to be here or whatever. God, that we take our stand as a country. And Lord, I pray that you'll forgive us where we failed you. And Lord, we failed you by not getting on our knees. We failed you by not calling out to you. We failed you because we've not listened to your word. And God, I pray today that those folks in Afghanistan and those people on the border, all the situations around that we're having issues with. I pray, God, that some way you could intervene. And, Lord, that you'll work all this according to your plan. We ask the Lord to be with our country. I ask you to be with our church service today. Be with our message today. Be with our people that we would hear what you have for us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And we'll leave it there. We'll come back and finish in a minute. But as you know, we're in a series, second message in a series, and we titled it, I could call it bad news, but we titled it good news to make it kind of positive. And, uh, and I hope you remember last week as we were talking about the gospel, and we said that, the, that it literally means, the gospel actually means good news. And, uh, but the word refers not just to the news, but to the one that brings the good news, the messenger. 
And we said that we're not the messenger. We're to share the news, of course. But the messenger is Jesus Christ. And we need to realize and understand that. So this is our second week. And I'll be talking about a word that's really bad today. And most everybody would agree that, I mean, it's bad news. And, uh, and that bad news, it'll always be bad news without the gospel. And that's what I want us to see today. See, the gospel can take a bad word and make it good. Make it good news. Last week we talked about that word condemnation. The word condemnation is a death sentence <laughs> instead of, uh, but through Christ, it becomes an eternal life sentence. Now, Romans 8 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So the condemnation can be good if it's in Christ Jesus. There's none for us today. So today, I'm talking about a bad word that so many really think that is only bad. And, but it's actually a good word. And it's good news. And that word is repentance. Repentance. So I really believe that uh, many believers have a bad view of this word. And they, they, they don't like it. The word repent means something different than what we probably think it means. Because we just know the word repent, and then we've heard preachers say it. And, uh, and I want us to do some changing of our thought process today, our thought pattern on this word. The word means, the word repent means to change your mind. In the verb form of that word, it means to change your mind. Or you might say, change the way you think. That would be the noun process of that word. Now, uh, after I surrendered to go to college, when I was 18 years old in 1970. Boy, that's a long time ago. Man. It, what was you, about 50 back then? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, it's easy to pick on. He's just sitting right there in front. He sees me. He stands out. But uh, after I surrendered in 1970, there seemed to be several opportunities for me to preach before I even went to college. And then after I went to college, come home, I get to preach sometimes. And, but all I knew at that time, because I had grown up in this real small church, and my preacher was there sometimes, and sometimes he wasn't because he worked the job. He'd get called off on Saturday night and couldn't get off to get back. And so he would make calls, and he'd call me sometime at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and say, I need you to speak today. I'm thinking, yeah, right. He said, no, seriously, Ed, Eddie. And so anyway, all I knew, though, when, at that time was to listen to what I could hear from preaching from my book pastor. And, of course, I had my Bible. Being 18 and nothing but my Bible and my Haley's handbook, Haley's Bible handbook, my sermon sounded a lot like my pastor's because that was all I knew. I'd pick up this, I'd pick up that, and use some of the stuff I could find. But words at that time in my life were just words, and stories in the Bible were my best friend. And, but for sure, the word came up in my preaching because my country pastor said it a lot. He used that word, repent. And I remember saying, you need to repent. And meaning, when I said that, I was meaning that you need to change your mind. You need to change your heart. You need to change your life. You need to change your actions. You need to change the way you live. That's what I had in mind. But eventually later in my ministry, in my time together in college and then after that, and I got a, another book called the Vines Book of Words. And uh, anyway, uh, other Bible programs that we have and uh, great minds of the gospel that were way smarter than me and those smarter than me taught me what that word actually means, the word repent. The word repent means to change your mind. Now, now let me just say, I wondered about that. And so when I was here, I was one day talking to Brother Shiver, who was my mentor and my, one of my best, best friends ever. And uh, I told Brother Shiver that my thought process on the word meant to change your heart. And I came to see it that way, and it was when Brother Shiver talked to me, and 
he told me, and, and Brother Shiver was a very patient man with this knucklehead. And I was a knucklehead. I proved that to be true many times. But uh, he was very patient with me, and he was kind with me most of the time. And, uh, but Brother Shiver told me that I did not have the ability to change a human heart. He said, only God can change a heart. But God gave each of us the ability to change our minds. And if we would change our minds, then God would change our hearts. So you see the word repent now? See where it's working? And that sort of stuck with me. But now I reverted back a lot to what I thought I knew. Sometimes you get the waxing eloquently, as they say, and you revert back to what you think you know, and you say things. You've heard me say it. So, you know, you're going this way, and you repent, and you turn around and go this way. Right? You've seen me do that many times over here just in this pulpit. And so anyway, I remembered that. But then I remembered again occasionally this time here, and this message came. And, uh, and I want to cover this in the message today. That's what I want to talk about. So see, there are three areas that we should change our minds today. And the first one is change your mind about repentance. Change your mind about repentance. Because the everyone thinks is a bad word. And <laughs> let me tell you, you know why people think it's a bad word? Because of preachers. Because of us. Preachers have used this as a bad word. And this is how we do it. We say, you know, you need to repent. And we do that. We scream it out. We get loud with it. Repent. You people need to repent. Well, let me say this. You do. I do as well. And we use it that way. And then preachers define it by their own definition. For instance, if you ask people what it means, here's what some will say. It means to turn from sin and turn to God. Well, that's okay, but that is not the definition of the word repent. That is a result of repenting. But be sure that it's not the word, what the word means. If you're going to define a biblical word in our Bibles today, you have to go back to the word itself and the word that it was written in and the language it was written in for you to actually understand. You know, we've talked about this. Hebrew is the Old Testament language, and Greek is the New Testament language, for the most part. Now, I'm no scholar of Greek, but I know how to look up words and study them. And when I take the time to do that, I'm sort of baffled how I've used it. Because it means what it says in the King James Bible, but I'm looking at it in a different way, because I'm looking at it from polite style. And that'll get you in trouble. And, but I will tell you that I can get excited when I chase a word back to its actual meaning, which is so often totally different than how I was trying to use it. Another reason I like uh, this kind of word study is because the Greek is so precise. I mean, there's, you know, we use this, the word, the Greek word for love, the word we use love, there's four Greek words for love. In fact, in fact, in fact there's six. And, uh, but most of us have either used or heard the term, and, uh, and, and we'll say this. We say, well, that's Greek to me. Have you ever heard that? That's Greek to me. Well, I know a little Greek, not much. But I know a little bit. But I could say, it's plumbing to me. <laughs> or I can say, it's IT to me. Because I have no clue. Because my expertise in IT is that when my computer messes up, I hit restart. Or I hit control all, control all delete. And we go over it again. And that's it. That's all I know. So if that don't work, then I call Eddie. And Eddie will say, well, do this, do this, do this. And I'll say, okay, it didn't work. He said, you need to call John. So I call John. And John goes something like this. He fixes it for me, and then he says this. Here's what happened. Is your iDrive was not communicating with your F drive. And then 
your F drive tried to kick in and your E drive moved and your X drive showed up. <laughs> John can get out there, you know, sometime. And all the while, I get sort of lost in the fog talking to John about computers. I'm in the dark. So my deal is, as long as I have Eddie's cell phone number or John's cell phone number, I'm good. I don't need to know all about the F drives and the I drives and the X drives. I don't need that. So what I'm saying here is there are things that I can do and there's things that others can do. I don't do computers. I don't do plumbing well. I do plumbing, but it takes a week to do a minor job, like just changing the, the water thing in the back, in the tank. <clears throat> We, we do without a toilet for a week while I'm trying to figure out how to put it back. But anyway, I'm glad we got two bathrooms. But anyway. Now, we're all to do what we can and let others do what they can. So again, all I need to know is a phone number and ask for help. Or I need to know a place to go for word study to go to find it. So let me give you a definition. So, and don't let preachers come along and tell you to turn from sin to turn to God because that's not the definition. But it could be the result of one aspect of it. See, repentance, which comes from two Greek words, and I know y'all have been waiting to hear this, but they come from two Greek words. You put them together. The Greek word is metanoia. Meta means change, like metamorphosis. And noia means mind. Change mind. That's what the word repentance means. Now that's the noun form. The verb form is metanoia. And I know you want to know that. But that means change the way you think. So think is an action. It's a verb. So it changed the way you think. Changed your mind. Now let me, let me show you just a couple other things here and then we'll move on. But uh, the first time the word repent is in the New Testament is in our text. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1 says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew, one chapter later, verse chapter 4 verse 17 says, From that time Jesus began to preach. And to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right? Now I want you to notice a couple things. First of all, I said last week, and I bear saying it again, that Jesus and John both came preaching, but they never preached, for hell is at hand. They didn't say that. But heaven is at hand. All right? They brought good news, is what I'm trying to tell you. In other words, they didn't bring the bad news. They only brought good news. But again, every time you learn a definition, you start putting the definition in the sentence and you read it like, here's what John and Jesus were saying. John, for instance, changed the way you're thinking is what it means. Changed the way you're thinking about having a relationship with God. You've been thinking that way that your right relationship with God is by what you do. And let me tell you something. That is not. The way it is. So, John and Jesus said, we're coming to tell you. And John said, I'm telling you the Messiah is coming right after me. That's what he was saying in his passage. Now, Jesus, when he said it, he said, I'm telling you, I am the Messiah. And because I am the Messiah, a whole new covenant is being set up. In other words, it's not a covenant of works. But it's a covenant of grace. I need you to change your mind. That's what we need to see. Understand that. See, the way we hear this is that John and Jesus showed up and both of them said the word repent. All right? In essence, this is what we hear. You, when you say the word repent, when the preacher says it like, repent, here's what you hear. Everybody does. I do. Here's what we hear is, uh, you ready? You dirty, rotten, low-down sinners. You all need to change the way you're living and you can go to heaven. That's what I heard all my life. And But I want to go back to what my friend Brother Shiva said. In essence, you cannot change the way you're living. 
Listen, you can't change your mind about, but you can change your mind about who Jesus is. And when you understand who Jesus is, then you can change the way you live if you let him change you. All right? And Jesus can change the way you're living. And so the word repent now is not such a bad word. It actually is a very, very good word. I also heard preachers say things like this. And, uh, and I, I was shocked. It's, uh, it was from a friend. That Christians never need to repent again. After they're saved. Never need to repent. Now, the problem with that is you have to understand their definition of the word repent. See, they were actually saved. It meant to them that you don't need to get saved again. And I agree with that. But repenting is not getting saved. But it's foolish to say Christians never need to change their minds. Listen, you need to change your mind. You need to repent. I know some of you. I know. I need to repent. I know me. And, uh, and so to be honest, we need to repent every day. And that means I have to change my mind. And when you have your quiet time, listen, and we ought to have a quiet time, you might need to make some adjustments or use another word, some correction in your, in your time. And this is something I had to learn myself when it was very difficult. And that is the adjustment, instead of asking God to do something in my life, when I take my Bible and I read, sometimes I just open it for a message. And I say, God, give me something. God, give me something. God, give me something. And sometimes when I'm just reading it to read it, I'm saying, God, give me something. Give me something. How many of you do that? Am I the only one to ask God to give them something when they read the Bible? Okay, I guess I am. Mine. I don't need to finish the message. <laughs> but here's what we do. We ask that. In some fashion, we want God to say something to us. We want God to speak to us. We want God to do something to us. Do something for us anyway. So when that happens, listen. What we need to do is to correct or make an adjustment. Because what happened is our devotional life is that uh, from asking God to give us something, we ought to bring something to God in our devotion. I mean, listen, when we come to worship on Sunday, listen, we should bring something to the Lord. And, uh, and if you only come to receive, then you're missing it. Why should you come to give? And this was an uh, area that I had to change my mind about. But the great thing is that with God, if you give to him, you will in return receive from him. All right? Now, let's for a few minutes talk about correction. Correction is part of repentance. The word correction is not a bad word. I mean, here's a question for you. And just think about this a minute, all right? I don't want you to raise your hands this time. Do not raise your hands because I'm setting you up. <laughs> All right? I'm, I'm letting you know I'm setting you up. So do not raise your hands because you'll want to raise your hands. I would want to raise my hands if I heard this question. So don't raise your hands. Don't look at the person beside you and say, mm -hmm. no, don't do that. Don't look at them. Because many times when we hear something, we say, yeah, you're talking to her. Or she said, talking to him. Right, sir? <laughs> okay, here's the question. Now, don't raise your hands. How many of you sometimes, don't raise your hands, hate correction or hate to be corrected? <laughs> don't raise your hands. Now, let me read a scripture to you. I'll answer it for you. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1, he that hated reproof is brutish. Now the word brutish, you know what it means? Stupid. It means like a dumb animal. And some people are even write it in this way. He who hates correction is stupid. And we hate correction, don't we? Yeah. But you don't you like how God just says what he thinks? Now the word brutish is translated most of the time in the Bible, foolish. Alright? But it's foolishness to hate correction. 
Think about this. If you're going away and you miss a turn on the road and your GPS starts saying, recalculating, recalculating, what do we do? Oh, man, you dumb thing. We get mad at the, at the GPS. And all the GPS is doing is trying to straighten you out. It's trying to get you to turn around. And, you know, listen, you need not to get mad at that at it because it's going to keep you from going hours out of the way. Because if you keep continuing going in the wrong direction, guess what? You're further away from where you're headed. And you know what? So when the Holy Spirit says to you, recalculating, listen, I need you to change your mind is what he's saying. Holy Spirit said, change your mind. I want you to change your mind about the word repentance. It's not a bad word. It's a good word. Here's the second thing, and I want to change your mind about it. And I want to change your mind about yourself. Change your mind about yourself. You see, the reason many of us don't like to be corrected is because it makes us feel like a bad person. If I get corrected too often by Sheila, oh, no, she never does that. She lays out hints. But I call it correction. And I need a lot of that. But it's because the reason we don't like correction is because it makes us feel like a bad person. And you say, when you get corrected, I must be inside. You don't say this out loud. You say, I must be a bad person. I need to be corrected this much. <clears throat> In other words, it's not my behavior. It's me as a person is what we say. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, change your mind. It says, repent. You therefore and be converted. That's when God does the work in our lives. A change comes, all right? It says that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. See, times of refreshing come only after we change our minds, after we repent. Now, I'm going to say something to you that I don't always live by, but I do sometimes. And that is, I like to repent. And you say, well, I don't really like that. I like to repent. You know why? Because there's fruit after you repent. There's something good happens after you repent. It really does. That's what happens. And see, I have found out that I'm wrong a lot. And I have to repent a lot. But anyway, because see, if you repent, it can only make you stronger. And that's what it should do. So you need to find out why we reacted incorrectly in the first place. See, when you repent, then you can become and learn what the Lord is trying to teach you. But if you're staying on the stubborn road of going this way, and the Holy Spirit saying go that way, you get further from where you're supposed to be. He said, recalculate, turn around, change the way you think. All right? Now, if that's you, and you have a problem receiving correction, here's what I've discovered on my own, and yes, it's been pointed out to me by others time to time, but the reason I don't like correction is because it sometimes actually goes all the way back to something in my childhood. And we don't like to talk about that, because that's something else. Or it's something that happened in a broken relationship we had. Now, you're viewing every correction now through that incorrect correction that you received as a kid. And every time you get corrected now, you're reverting back to when you were miscorrected or wrongly corrected as a child. And so now you're thinking, I'm getting corrected because I was like, this. you know, we need to understand we're a Christian now. The Holy Spirit is the one that corrects us. And he will correct us if we will allow him to. But so often it takes a person like Pat to say something to me. Eddie to say something to me. Sheila to say something to me. To correct me. Because I didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. So we need to come to the place that we're willing to change our minds. Remember the verses I said that both Jesus and John came preaching. John, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, the Bible says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now here Jesus is saying, I need to change your mind about the way you see yourself. 
So repentance is a good word for believers. Repentance is being honest with yourself. Letting some, uh, someone else give you a perspective that you might not have. I mean, I called some of you guys and said, what do you think about this? What do you, what would you do? How would you look at this? Because I need another perspective. See, to change your mind, and God can change you when you change your mind. So my last thought this morning in this is I want you to change your mind about Jesus. All right? I want you to start seeing Jesus. Uh, maybe it's a little bit different today. Do you know the number one complaint against Jesus when he was here in the ministry? When he was here on earth? Don't answer, but what do you think it is? Just think in your mind right now. The number one answer that people give to that is the word blasphemy. And they did say that a lot. But that wasn't really it. That was the actual charge they brought against him on, before he went to the cross. But the number one complaint is found in Luke chapter 15, verse 1. And it says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now what a charge. He eats with sinners. That's crazy, isn't it? He eats with sinners. By the way, all of you have eaten with sinners. I don't care who you ate with, you ate with sinners. I mean, it doesn't matter. In Luke chapter 7, verse 34, it says, The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine giver, a friend of publicans and sinners. He called him a friend of sinners. You ever wonder why sinners like to hang out with Jesus? You ever thought about that? Why, why do they like to hang out with Jesus? Well, Mark chapter 2, verse 15 says, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, he's at Levi's house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician. But they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now remember what the word repentance means. Because we need to read that in. He called the sinners to change the way they were living. Or should we read it this way? He called the sinners to change their minds about what they thought of him. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he was doing. See, I think Jesus showed up, and I think the reason he ate with sinners was to say to them, you need to know something here, and that is the Father and I love you, and that the Father and I don't judge you because you're already judged. He didn't come. To do that to them. He didn't come to judge them. Remember last week we read that he didn't come to condemn us or to judge us because we were already judged, condemned. He came rather to forgive us. That's what he came for. Now take note of three statements that will be on the screen. First of all, God is not mad at you. All right. Number two, God is not disappointed in you. Number three, and God is not surprised by you. Now remember this. God is not mad at you. God is not disappointed with you. And God is not surprised by you. Now, nothing you could ever do can surprise God. You say, oh, I think I have. Nope, 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 nope. You know why? Because he is all-knowing. He knows everything. See, you have never committed a sin or will commit a sin that will be outside of the foreknowledge of God. He knows everything. The gospel, the love of Christ does not have exclusions. It does not say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever except Ed Wiles between 1968 and 1970 can be forgiven because I really didn't know he was going to be that bad in high school. <laughs> it doesn't say that. Repentance is not a bad word. It's actually a good word. It just means you change your mind. It means that you understand. And I want you not only to change your mind about yourself, I want you to change your mind about how much Jesus loves you. And listen, and Jesus shows up, and the first word he preaches is, change your mind because heaven is here. He's arrived. Change your mind about, you know, how you're going to have a relationship with him. See, because the more you live in the darkness, the more you give the enemy permission to work. Listen, the enemy works in the dark. Yeah. Understand that. He doesn't like light. Remember that nothing happens outside of the purview of an all-knowing God. And listen, the very one that knew all about you, and he still sent his son to die for you. He knows everything, and he still loves you. And not only does he love you, but he died for you. Yes, he even gave his life so you and I could be forgiven. And have an eternal life, abundant life on this earth. Listen, he loves each and every one of us today. He knows, he knows all about you and he still loves you. Repentance is not a bad word. Listen, it is an ongoing, it is not a one-time event in Christians. For Christians. But it all begins when you repent. It starts. And it's an ongoing lifestyle that we should adopt. That we are that we continue to change our minds and allow God then to change our hearts. That's what I want you to see today. The good news from the bad news. Because Christ is inside. It makes a difference. Let's bow our heads, please. I want you to take a moment. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today in this message?